Hey, this is Joe Gilder from Personas. Let's talk about how mastering works inside of Studio One. Okay, I've already done a video, actually a couple of videos that demonstrate the functionality of the project page as it relates to the song page, the way that the songs and the projects are connected under the hood. So when you update a song, it will automatically update in the project page or the mastering window. But today I wanna to talk about specifically how is the project page laid out for mastering and a couple of different ways that I use it on my mastering projects. Now let's just assume for this video that someone sent you just a five WAV files, and you're going to bring those into a project for mastering. So we're not worried about the song page at all. These are just songs that I've dragged and dropped into the session. A uh, couple of things to know about how things are laid out. First of all, let's talk about metering for a second. So if I hit play on one of these songs, I've got it muted so you can't hear. The metering right here allows us to choose a bunch of different options. I would encourage you to play around with it, do some research on what these different modes are and how they work. This is typically where I like to work is with the spectrum analyzer showing me in third octave so I can see like big chunks of audio, see where some bigger frequencies are bouncing up and down here or there. I don't use that a lot for mastering. Um, it's nice to have, it looks pretty, it's kind of fun. This one maybe looks even cooler. Um, but it, it is helpful if you're trying to find a frequency to say, oh, there was one that jumped up right there at around 500. But typically, I'm much more of a fan of using your ears. Um, down here in the level meter, this is where I will set it to K14, which is kind of my go-to for mastering. And the goal there for me, it's really simple. See how this, this meter here, it's going horizontal, but it has negative 30 up to zero and up. You'll notice if I increase the volume of this particular track, that we've got the volume going up, it turns into yellow here and then red up here. It's important to note these are the average volumes of this piece of audio. And my goal when mastering to K14 is for the bulk of the song, even the quieter parts, to hit here around zero. And then for the verses and choruses are kind of hanging in the yellow and the loudest parts of the choruses and maybe bridge are hitting in the red. So it hits the red occasionally and lives in the yellow mostly and doesn't drop down too far below green. What happens if you if you go by this kind of quote unquote rule, you'll end up with a song that will need to be limited, right? That's what mastering is. We put a limiter at the end of the chain. That's a part of what mastering is. We're able to increase the volume without clipping anything. But as you can see, if I try to increase this one up to where it's hanging out in the between the yellow and the red, we can see this clip light goes off. So we need something in place to handle that. I've increased the volume here by 7.8 decibels, and that's starting to clip those loudest peaks in the mix. That's where a limiter can come in. So let me show you kind of how I lay out my sessions as far as workflow. And in doing so, that'll demonstrate some of the ways that the, some of the functionalities within the project page. So let's bring a limiter in. So here's the default limiter inside of Studio One. I'm gonna drag it here to this master section. So take a look here. You'll notice there are a few different sections here and it can be confusing if it's your first time. Up here, this is the per song inserts section. Down here is the master section. Much like you have channels and your master fader or your main output in a mix session, it behaves the same way, although it does look different. So as you can see, this is song number five. If I pull this fader down for song five, we can go to song four and the fader is up. You see what I mean? We're switching between songs. So plugins change it as well. Let's say we put an EQ on song number four. Okay, there's an EQ there. When I switch to song five, you see that disappear. So it's showing us what's on each individual track, okay? Now, let's focus specifically on this song number five. I like to work backwards when I'm mastering. I learned a lot of this from my buddy Ian Shepard over at the Production Advice blog. Uh, Ian's great. So I'll set up a limiter with a ceiling of negative one decibel, a full decibel down, so we don't have any sort of intersample peaks happening. There are lots of limiters to use. I used this limiter for a long time, and then I discovered the FabFilter uh, L2, it was the Pro L2 limiter. Uh, that's what I've been using lately, but this is where I would put the limiter in my master section. Now you notice there's two sections here. There's inserts and there's post. This has to do with whether it comes before or after this fader. Um, it really, if you never move the fader, which I never do in these situations, then it doesn't really matter at all. If this fader is going to stay at zero, you can put these wherever. I tend to do this. I put my processing up here. So if I put, let's say, let's say overall all the mixes have a little bit of a rumble down at like 40 hertz, I might put a very low high pass filter over across all my masters and then the limiter. And then if I want any extra metering, let's say I want to put in 
uh, my level meter because I want to resize it and move it over to the right hand side of my screen. Um, that all goes in the post section for me and that's the way I work. Um, if you want to put in, uh, get the phase meter out and make it nice and big so you can check if everything's staying in phase, you can put that as a plug-in, then you can expand that out. You'll see when I hit play, we can see how the stereo image is looking. This correlation meter, typically we want that to stay to the right, stay in the positive. If it's dropping down to the left, something's out of phase and you might need to address that. As you may have noticed, there's a small version of the phase correlation meter here, uh, but if you want a bigger one, or if you don't want your main level meter to be right here, you've got those as plugins you can insert in the post section and arrange them however you want. Okay, workflow for me. Uh, this is typically, this changes for me from, from master to master, from year to year. But typically what we're trying to do is, one of the things we want to do is increase the volume. The way I've started to do that lately, if I mixed all these songs and they're at roughly the same volume, and I know, just like we saw, I need to get about 7 or 8 dB of gain typically out of them to get it up into the right volume level that I want, just to, as a starting point. What I'll do is take, I'll add that volume at the limiter itself. So I'll open up the limiter, whether it's this one or any other one, and I'll add, let's add seven decibels of gain. And so when I hit play, even a lot of this, it's, 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 I hate to say it, but a lot of this you can do even without listening, like right now. I'm just checking levels. Let's get everybody up around this zero mark. So I'm just going through, kind of clicking in the louder sections of the songs, and they're all kind of hanging out around there. These last two are a little bit louder and I would wonder if that's a little bit too much but it's not hitting the red too much. This one seems to be in the red a little bit more than the other. So I'm going to take this song and I just click on the region here and it automatically jumps to the song here as well and I'll pull that fader down just a little bit. And I'm literally, I know you shouldn't master with your eyes but this is one part where I'm just getting the basic level. We can always go back and make adjustments from here. Now I will listen on a per song basis and I'll put in EQ if it needs compression, if it needs multiband, that's all included in Studio One Professional, by the way. If you want to do multiband processing, there's a multiband dynamics plugin that you can put in. I like to divide mine into three different sections and have it process the lows, mids, and highs independently. Um, that's a subject for another day. But I like to put all of those types of plugins here on the individual channels themselves. So what it'll, it'll look like usually is I take the first song, I'm listening, I may take a little bit of a little bit out here, a little bit up here, and then maybe I decide this one does need some multiband, so I put some multiband on that song. Once that's sounding really good, then I'll say, okay, let's move on to song number two. Okay, song two sounds a lot like song number one. I'm gonna put my mouse up here over the word insert, click and drag onto song two, and now song two has the same effects as song one. Now, I don't just move on from there, that's just my starting point. I listen and I say, okay, that sounds cool. I actually don't want the multiband on this song and the EQ could use a little more down here at like 80 hertz or something. Those are the kind, the, the workflows that I use. But if they're all songs that were performed and mixed by the same person, typically they're gonna all have similar needs when it comes to EQ and compression and things like that. Now I know a lot of folks wanna ask about the different level meters and loudness measurements, and I'll be completely honest, I stick with the K system and I don't worry about the others. Is that a bad thing? Maybe. I just, I get results that I like and I just keep doing it. Now, when your songs are finished and you're ready to export them, a couple of things, you can have overlaps between the audio files. So if you want one to fade into the other, like a live record, you can do that and you can move, drag them around to do that. There's a lot of variation you can put in here, whether you're holding on to the option key or not, it will move around differently as you're clicking and dragging. So play around with that if you haven't already. You can also adjust the fades in and especially out if the person forgot to do a fade out or you think it could use a better fade, you can come in here and you can draw that fade in nicely. Now when you're ready to export things as a WAV file or an MP3, you come up to digital release and here's where we can choose all the settings you're probably used to. Let's export these all as 16-bit WAV files and go. There's a setting, by the way, inside of preferences under advanced, uh, I believe it's under audio, that says use dithering for playback and audio file export. So if you're familiar with mastering, part of if you take a 24-bit file and you're going to send it out as a 16-bit or smaller file, then you need to add dither to it. Don't worry about it. The cool thing about Studio One is it just adds it for you. Instead of having to have a dithering plugin or to have a limiter that is adding dither, you just don't have to worry about it. Are there people out there who say you should worry about it? Yes, I'm sure, and they are smarter than me. This has worked fine for me. I like simple solutions. If you're mastering for a client and they want to upload to disc makers, the DDP image will allow you to do that. 
Um, and you can also just save a actual like disk image. You can burn a CD from here if you're into that sort of a thing. And clicking here will update all those mastering files like we talked about before. One other thing, you can actually name this album and artist and that will propagate to each of the song files if you're exporting as an mp3 for example that meta information will be saved into the mp3 little note wave files don't support that type of thing as far as i know so exporting as a wave file will just be a blank wave file typically what i do is i then upload those wave files into something like distrokid that puts it onto spotify and apple music and everything else and I label everything in DistroKid while I'm uploading it, and then all of that information disseminates out uh, and is connected to those files as DistroKid processes those. Will there be different ways of doing it in the future? Probably, but this is my method and my workflow. Big kind of bird's eye view overview, um, but that's how I've been doing mastering, and Studio One makes that really easy. There's no custom setup. There's no having to turn your mix system into a mastering system for mastering. We've got it on its own dedicated page that works super well. So that's it. Thanks so much for watching. If you're just seeing this video and you haven't seen any other of my videos in this series, if you look in the YouTube description down below, there will be a link to the entire playlist of all my Studio One with Joe Gilder videos. Uh, and this video is the end of, I believe it was a 13 part series going over the basics basic overview of the core functionality of Studio One. So if you're new to Studio One and you caught this one about mastering, but you want to go back over the other basics, I highly recommend checking out the rest of that playlist in addition to all the other videos we have here on the Personas channel. Make sure to like the video and hit the subscribe button so you don't miss future videos. I've got a lot of fun stuff planned. Can't wait to share it with you. But until then, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.